Can you guys hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Well, praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you guys. I see some friends of mine back there. You know who you are. Friends. Uh, happy Sabbath. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be here with my family, my wife and daughter, soon to be son coming home. Uh, the holidays are a good time for family, fellowship, and I'm just thankful to be here this morning. How many of you are thankful that the year is almost over? <laughs> I, I, always, I joke about this, but this is semi-serious. There's sometimes I come in the Sabbath running. There's sometimes I come in the Sabbath crawling. And there's sometimes I'm being dragged into the door. It's been that kind of week, and, and that's been that kind of week. But God is merciful, and God is through it. So praise the Lord. Um, before we get started, I'd like to start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your mercy. We want to thank you for getting us through another week and almost through this year. We just ask that you continue to bless us and that you uh, guide us into your truth this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I really enjoy studying, just on my own, you know, I'm not a, I didn't take this in school or anything like this, but I love history. I love how history sometimes can predict what's going to happen in the future because sometimes we see patterns. You know, what's happened before will happen again. And one of the things that I, I've seen if you, when you study the, the history of humanity, you see consistently that human beings have this tendency to put our trust in people that are not trustworthy. You guys know what I'm talking about? How many of you voted? There's my answer right there. <clears throat> we consistently put people in power that shouldn't be ruling over us. They don't care about us. They have no inclination to help us. They're only there for themselves. And a lot of times it leads us to ruin because we've allowed that to happen. Now, in some cases, the, the population may not have had a choice. You know, we've seen in the last hundred years the wars, the dictators, the evil people that have taken over uh, various places in the world and have caused chaos and mayhem and murder and all this destruction. But there's a repeated pattern of human beings that we continually allow people who have no business to have authority over us. And I want to compare this a little bit to how God intended for us to be. You guys know uh, originally in the, the Garden of Eden, if you've heard me preach, if you haven't, I'll give you a, a quick refresher. In the Garden of Eden, we had a perfect, ideal place. Now, it's hard for us to imagine peace and prosperity. It's hard for us to imagine waking up every morning refreshed. I literally get out of bed in the morning like this. Ready, trying to go into the day, you know, prepared for whatever, whatever is there for me. And it's hard for me to even know what a good night's sleep is. How many of us eat right all the time? How many of us regret, we have, I call it the Adventist hangover. We ate something we shouldn't have ate, and not only did we eat it, we ate too much of it. And the next morning we're paying for it, the next day maybe. You can imagine... In the garden, we had everything perfect. The perfect food, the perfect job, the perfect spouse. Everything was perfection. It's hard for us to imagine that. I get paranoid on days that things go too good. Amen. I go to the store and there's no line. <clears throat> I get the bill that I thought was going to be more and it's less. And I say, what's going on? Something's not right. It can't be this easy today. But God in his love for us, as an expression of his love, gave us this planet. And it wasn't just this planet, it was the things of the planet. He gave us good food to eat. Our original heavenly diet, fruits, grains, and nuts. All things that were easily pickable. You can imagine going into the garden and you don't have to work for anything. You don't have to cook anything. You don't have to stand in line. You just go pick it and eat it. And everything that you have is good for you. 
Everything that you eat is nourishable and, and, and brings about health and life and good sleep. And, 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 and you're, you wake up in the morning awakened and fresh. And God gave us the perfect job. He gave us dominion. Dominion means he put us in charge. We were in charge of the planet. Now you guys know already, would you put us in charge of the planet? Would you trust any one human being on this planet to run the place? No. Nope. And it went about as well as expected. But the difference is, is that Adam and Eve were perfect. They weren't falling like us. They hadn't degraded to the point where they had their attention, you know, constantly diverted by something else. They had no anything to compete with their attention. They didn't have social media. They didn't have fake news. They didn't have politicians trying to rob them. They didn't have people trying to steal from them or trying to, you know, do bad things to them. They had none of that. And they still fell. If you would turn me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And this is what happens when God has given us dominion. And, and I want you to understand this because this is the key concept for this morning and this whole message. Is that in order for us to have dominion, who has to be the ultimate authority? God. It has to be God. God has to reign supreme. Because the only reason we have dominion is because of Him. So if we remove Him, what does that also remove? Us. It removes our dominion. Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Now, for those of you who don't know, did God know where they're at? Does your mother know where you're at? Of course she does. She's not asking you because she doesn't know. She wants you to understand where you're at. Probably in a place doing something you shouldn't be doing. And this is what God was, was trying to get Adam to, to, you know, to understand for him to, that light to go on and to say, I'm hiding from God. God's never done anything to me to hurt me. Why am I hiding from him? Continuing on, it says, So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Now, husbands, if you want to end up on the couch, the quickest way is to blame your wife and God. In the same sentence, no less. <laughs> now... We laugh about that, but, but the fact is, is that that's what he was doing. He was saying, well, this defective person you gave me, she led me away. So it's either her fault or your fault. That's what he's telling God. Now, again, Adam never had a contention with God before. God never did anything to hurt Adam. He gave him nothing but love and blessings and life. And this is his response to God. It says, and Lord God gave, said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So what went wrong? You notice they were both blaming someone else, something else. Neither one of them took ownership. Hey, I messed up. I thought it was something else. Hey, I just went along with my wife, whatever. No, it was always blaming somebody else. Now, I want to read the, the actual interaction between Eve and the serpent to see if what she said was actually true. Because she said she was deceived, right? That was her, her defense to God that she had been deceived. This is from chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So he asked Eve, did God really say that? This is the lie that Satan perpetuates throughout history. Did God really say that? Does the Bible really mean that? I mean, wasn't it different in the Hebrew? I mean, the translators got it wrong. I've heard every excuse in the book. 
you know, that God didn't really mean that, or that that word really doesn't mean what it means. And I've heard everything under the sun to try to divert the fact that God said what he said. So what is Eve's response? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, was she deceived or not? No, she knew what God had said. Did Adam know what God had said? Yes. So what happened here is that God reigned supreme. His authority was supreme in their lives. In other words, his word was supreme. The things that he said were to be followed. And once they diverted from that, and they started believing what someone else said or something else said, then they took the authority from God and gave it to who? Who now has authority on the, on the earth? Satan. Satan has authority. And I want you to imagine spouses, and I'll pick on the wives first and the husbands after, okay? I want you to imagine, husbands, that your, your wife that you have a covenant with, that you sworn before God that you would love to, in sickness and in health, that every major decision in life that you'll discuss, and that you both have agreed to serve the Lord wholeheartedly, and she comes home one day and says, you know, I ran into this random guy at Safeway, and he told me I should do this, and I did it. How many of you would think that would go over well? If your wife came home and said, I ran into some random guy, and he said, yeah, yeah, did your husband really say that? Did you guys really agree on this? Here, you need to do this thing. And now your marriage is in jeopardy. This is what Eve did, effectively. She trusted some random source. She did not have a relationship with, with Satan. It wasn't like they talked every day, and over time, she, you know, he kind of like worked it in there. This is somebody she just met. And immediately she turns away from the word of God. And then she blames the serpent. So was Adam any better? So imagine this scenario again. The wife comes home and says, hey, this random guy told me to do this. I know we agreed on this other thing, but we're going to do this now. Or I already did it. I already committed to it. Sorry. You should probably do it too. And then the husband says, yeah, that sounds great. Now we have a failure of both the husband and the wife. So the checks and balances that God put in place, that's why he always sent out the disciples in twos, if you notice, is so that if one headed in a wrong direction, the other one can say, hold on, brother, hold on, sister. Let's think about this. Let's go before the Lord. And so Adam and Eve both ceded the authority of God to Satan. They had dominion. They had the right of this earth to rule it. And they gave it over. What God had, had given them freely in love and in expression of his creation, they gave over freely to the devil. And then proceeded to blame each other. Now, God was not mad at Adam for listening to his wife. He was upset with Adam because he heeded his wife's voice. There's a difference. There's a difference between listening and saying, okay, let's talk about it, than actually doing it. And I cannot stress this enough, that God has put you in a marriage to help each other. Not help each other sin, not help each other go the wrong way, but if your husband or wife comes home and tells you something that's contrary to the word of God, it is your duty as a spouse to say, hold on a second. You have to stand on the word of God. If I say something contrary to the scriptures, my wife will call me out on it. She better. That's what love is. She's looking out for me, looking out for her. My wife comes to me and says, hey, I think we should make this decision, and it's contrary to what the Word of God says. I'm going to say, you know what? We need to pray about this. I don't agree with this. 
That's what love is. But if you notice here, Adam and Eve, they didn't have that. Eve disregarded her husband, and Adam disregarded his wife. Where was the love there? But it seemed that everybody was listened to except God. And they knew the word of God. They knew what he said, and he disregarded it. And now that dominion was lost. They were now no longer under God. They were under Satan. Now, we know God provided the earth and provided sustainability and perfection and life and liberty and peace. What does Satan provide? Walk outside. Drive around the island. And we have it better than most here in the islands. Lucky we live in Hawaii. But even then, you will see the, the sinfulness of this world. Turn on the news. Death, destruction, mayhem, pandemics. People fighting that can't even agree on what to do about a pandemic. You have people that don't care that, that people are dying. I mean, it's, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And this is what happens when we are under the authority of Satan. He has no care for us. The only thing he provides us is death. He says the wages of sin is death. And we traded all that. For what? What do we get in return? Nothing but heartache. Nothing but destruction. Now who does the... What does the Bible constantly compare a woman with in the Bible? Church. Church. So I want you to think about this for a minute. As God had provision after the fall of man, he knew it was going to happen. So his provision is to bring us back under his authority. So how did he do that? The woman. The church. God raised the nation. The Jewish nation, the nation of Israel. And he entrusted them with the oracles of God. He trusted them with the law and the prophets. He entrusted them with the tabernacle service, which was supposed to point us to the Messiah that was to come, his son. And he said, I've established this institution to restore order on the earth and to be a light amongst all the peoples, to bring them back to me. To take the authority back from the devil and restore it to the God who is a God of love. And not a being of hate like Satan. And what happened with that church? Was she faithful? Or did she do like Eve? What happened was the church, instead of having God supreme, and his word supreme, the church became supreme. And that's dangerous. They no longer worship the God of the church, they worship the church itself. And what do they do? They misalign the character of God. They cause, instead of causing light in the world and God to be drawn, you know, people to be drawn into to, to God's kingdom, they drew them into further darkness. And now they were under Satan as well. And see, this is the deception, see. Satan initially targeted husband and wife in the garden. And when God raised the church, he targeted the church. Because the original institution that was supposed to protect the earth was marriage. And that failed. So his next institution was the church which was also supposed to be a marriage between the woman and the church and the congregation and the husband. That also failed. Because not only did the, did the wife, the church, apostatize, but the husband with her, the congregation. So now, the ones preaching and the ones hearing are both lost. And Satan still has authority. So now he has a church. But friends, this is why one of the reasons that I love the Lord so much is that he knew from me, he knows from beginning to end. He knew these things would happen. He knew that the provisions that he 
that he had, the, the, that he provided for, the, 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 the ceremonies and all these other things and the law, he knew they would be twisted. They were supposed to be a blessing. They were supposed to be a, a reminder that, that, that he was going to send his son to die for us. Instead, it was twisted. Instead of becoming an inclusive church, it became an exclusive church. Instead of building gates and highways into the church, they built walls. Does that sound familiar? But God had a fix for it. And this fix wasn't just for a time. This fix wasn't just for a place. This fix wasn't just for one people. This was a permanent fix forever. Does anybody know what the fix is? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the fix. If you would turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Starting with verse 6. When the church had been centralized, I want you to imagine that, you know, here today, you had a choice to come here. You could have chosen to go to church tomorrow anywhere else. There's a bunch of different churches you can choose. A variety of denominations. There's a variety of religions you could have chosen, too. They have their various server services. They have their various congregations, whatever. You chose to come into this church. But for the people of Israel, they only had two choices. They had secularism, secularism, I can't even say that word. You know what I mean, secular Rome, and they had a theocracy in Israel. Now, was the God of the Bible preached in either one of those situations? No. So the Jews, if they wanted to go to church, they had one choice. And that one choice was an apostate church. So they go and they hear about a God of the Bible who isn't really the God of the Bible. Can you imagine coming into the service this morning and hearing me preach that if you're poor, God doesn't love you? That if you're broken, that if you've had a tough week, that you can barely pay your bills, that God doesn't love you because if he did, he would have blessed you more? Can you imagine coming in this morning and, and having to check your, your credentials at the door and saying, you're not educated enough? God doesn't love you, obviously, or he would have blessed you more? This is what they were fixing at the time. They weren't even welcome in their own congregation. And so there was this exclusive God that was preached. There was this God of torment, a God of, of uh, you know, he, he didn't want to heal you. He didn't want to accept you. He didn't want to love you. He didn't want to forgive you. He didn't want anything to do with you. You can imagine the poor, the poor people, you know, when, when Christ came, how excited they were to hear God loves the poor. God loves the prisoner. God loves the sick. God loves the sinner. It says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. It will never end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Only God can fix it. And the only way he can fix it is through his son. So you had one church that had been centralized in the nation of Israel, and it, it had become apostate and was no longer preaching the God of the Bible. It was preaching that the church was supreme. So worship of God was no longer part of the service. It was worship of church, worship of nation. They were nationalists. They believed that the Israel nation reigned supreme, that they were meant to rule over the earth, and that's not what God had intended for them. So the miracle that Jesus performed is he removed the middleman. He removed the problem, which is what? Us. We were no longer in charge of the church. Who was in charge of the church? Christ. Christ.
Christ did away with the building. He did away with the services. He did away with the tabernacle. And what he did is he made a temple in us so he could come to us directly. He could bypass the middleman who was not preaching the truth. Sometimes we get caught up in love for denomination. We've got to be careful with that. I love being a Seventh-day Adventist. But my allegiance ultimately belongs to Christ and Christ alone. If I hear things that are not preached, if I hear things that are preached in, in, in our churches that are not biblical, then I have the Bible to compare it to. And this is what Christ was trying to do for us. Is he was trying to say, you don't need to hear it third hand or second hand anymore. You can hear it directly from me. If you want to know who I am here, here I am. Now, friends, was there a contrast in the God that was preached in Israel and in Jesus that came to save us? When he lived in, in this world and he, he mingled amongst the population, was his character different than what was being preached? The masses loved him. The people that before weren't even welcome in the temple, all of a sudden they were guests of honor in his presence. The lowly, the poor, the, the, the mother without a son, without any sustenance, all of a sudden she was lifted up and made to feel like she was a VIP. That's why I love that verse of, or the, the story of the prodigal. Is when the prodigal returned, he wasn't just brought back into the house. He was treated as a guest of honor. For those of us who have not lived honorable lives, to be at the table with Jesus and being treated as if we had lived honorably is a miracle. Amen. Only the love of God can do that. Amen. And so now God's fix is that he sends his son to reign supreme over the church and removes the middleman. And our tendency is to do what? Is to put the middleman back in place. How many denominations, including our own, are guilty of this, that God doesn't reign supreme all the time? Sometimes when you ask a theological question, someone will refer to you to a book other than the Bible. Or someone will refer you to a manual. That's not the way it works. It's supposed to be God's word reigns supreme. His word and his word only. Those other books, those other references are supposed to point you back to the Bible. This is where things go wrong. Did God really say that? You guys have heard my frustration. I, I hear preachers all the time try to explain to me what something means in Aramaic or Hebrew as if they speak fluent Aramaic or Hebrew. And they're trying to you know, discredit a, a verse in the Bible as if God didn't have the forethought to think that the translators would not get it right. That, you know, the translation of the English would be off enough that we needed the theologian to explain it to us. And this is what God was trying to bypass. He was trying to say, you guys constantly are putting other men, other people, even the devil himself above me, and I'm going to give you direct access to me again. We hadn't had that since the garden when he, walks the, when he walked amongst us. John 17 says this, and this is Christ praying. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. As you have sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. God has made us the church as individuals who comprise the church collectively. It does not comprise the building anymore. Even though I like coming to the building, this building is no longer here tomorrow. We have bad weather or something happens. Does that mean the church is gone? No. We are the church. We are the church. But the first church, the first institution of church again was marriage. That was the first church. The congregation was Adam and Eve. Then God moved that to a centralized nation. And that became the church. And that apostatized. 
So finally, he brought the church to us. Christ, Christ is the church. Christ is the answer. Christ is the fix. And I want you to think about this as I start to close. Adam and Eve knew what the Word of God said. The Israelites knew what the Word of God said. But they allowed other people, they allowed other influences, whether it was the world or the Satan or whatever, but you have to understand that any influence that, that, that is trying to get you away from God comes from one source, the devil. And we live in a world that we have plenty of sources to choose from, nearly all of which are trying to take you away from God. You know, I harp on this a lot, but I love information. I'm an IT guy, I'm a computer guy, I love being on a computer, I love searching things and reading about interesting things. But when I go to read something, or I go to watch something, or, to, or read an article, I have to go into that understanding that the majority of the world is lost. I also have to go into the understanding, even when I read religious materials, even the fellow Protestants, that the majority of the Christian world doesn't know who God really is. Which means that nearly every source that we have available to us is tainted. Except for what? The Word of God. This is the safeguard he gave us. And what happens sometimes is that instead of filtering what we hear externally through the Word of God, we start to drift away from the Word of God. This is what happened to Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? This is what happened to the Israelites, is they started using reason. They started to extrapolate from the Bible. Well, God didn't actually say this, but I think this is what he meant. And they started adding to the law. They had over 300 Semitic laws. All made up. All things that they thought that should be in there. Not what God had explicitly had said, but things that, that they thought, well, God surely meant this. And they started adding to things. We have denominations that add stuff all the time. You know, I grew up in a denomination that, that taught me eternal hell, which, which if, there's any, if there's any one doctrine that I, I will preach to my death about, it's that. That God tortures his creatures. That even the worst sinners get, go to hell for eternity. The majority of the Christian world believes that. Contrary to the word of God, who said the sinners are burned up. Who even say that Satan will be turned to ash in Ezekiel. There's plenty of examples. But you see, the world is tainted. Even our Christian world is tainted. Most have apostatized. Most don't preach the God of the Bible. They, 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 they preach the God of tradition, just like the Israelites did. They misinterpret things, and now God's character is misaligned. But his fix was Christ. His fix was to send his son to die for us. And friends, I want you to think about this for a minute as I close. What did it cost us to get dominion initially? So we were king and queen of the earth. We had a, a world that would live in perpetuity and in righteousness. We like to say in Hawaii, Pono, right? We had all that. It cost us nothing. God gave it freely. This is what God does. God gives everything he has and every part of himself up front for free. But with Satan, there's a cost. That's why it says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now think about this. We had dominion that was given freely. We gave it up. We ceded it over to Satan, who then has run us through the mill ever since. And has tried to kill every one of us. And it's trying to get us further and further away from God. So what did God have to do to restore that dominion? He had to buy it back. You can imagine you give a gift to your friend that's so precious that cost you everything you had. And then they go down to the, the pawn shop down the street. And they sell it for pennies on the dollar. To the new owner who doesn't care about the, the thing. 
and the only way for you to go get it back is to go pay a king's ransom for it so that your friend can have that gift that you initially had given to them that they took for granted and gave it away. This time of year reminds me of what it cost God to free us. He sent his son who had to pay for our dominion that we had given up. He had to pay with his own blood. He had to pay with his own shame. He had to pay with his own suffering. What I love about this time of year is we talk about the baby Jesus, but that's just part of the story. It's the man Jesus that died for us. The gift wasn't just the baby. The gift was the whole thing. From the baby growing up, learning that he was the Messiah, to living a perfect life, to showing who God is and the character of a loving, forgiving, merciful God that is more inclusive than exclusive. And finally, topping it off, that gift, the dying for us, so that he could purchase what we had given away. That's the God that we love and that's the God that we serve. And anybody, anything, any source that it tries to take you away from God and his word, disregard it, throw it away, delete it, don't go to that webpage, don't read that book, don't surf to that YouTube channel, stay safe. Stay safe with Christ. Stay safe with his word and stay safe with his gift. And we will have our dominion restored because of his purchase of it, because of his blood. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the fact that you gave us not just one gift, you gave us two gifts. You gave us initially the first gift that we disregarded and the second gift to purchase it back. Jesus for doing that for us because he paid the price for us that we can live in peace and harmony for eternity and that our membership in the church of Christ that the head and the, the authority will be Christ and Christ alone 